introduce Bethany Mead. Good morning. I have to say, I had a lot of fun doing the research for this, for this topic. Um, I'm going to start with The Little Theater from 1934. And it's a smaller work. It's a, it's a diorama, which uh, Dolly didn't do many of these. It's composed of 11 glass panes that juxtapose several peculiar small scenes. At the edges are an arch and a receding stage floor and an inkwell to the right that evoke the stage and an unseen playwright. And I start with this piece because, in a way, it represents the long-standing fascination that Dolly had with theatrical environments. So. Uh, Peter mentioned installation, so what I mean by environments really has to do with not only installations, but stage spaces uh, for the public. And the spaces that I'm going to talk about really capture recurring themes, ideas, and obsessions from Dolly's long career. Um, the spaces tend to be irrational, they're delirious, and they're rich in personal symbols. And it was the end of his time with the Surrealists that he collaborated on the infamous 1938 Surrealist Exhibition in Paris. And it's a really important project because um, it kind of propels Dali into his later solo installation works. So before I jump into that exhibition, I felt like it was important to kind of give some context about how that came about. And then uh, to talk about some of the environments that Dali did in America um, right afterwards in the late 30s and early 40s. And then um, talking about really his last um, installation, which was his theater museum in Figueres, where he is uh, buried. So I go to this slide, which is a page from a, a comic book that was done, um, kind of displaying the, the life of Dali in cartoon. And here's Dali as a child, and he's in um, his childhood classroom with Mr. Senor Trader. And so I, I put this here because I think Dali had an interest in curious spaces from uh, the time he was young. Uh, Mr. Trader was his favorite teacher from school, and he filled his classroom with uh, really unusual things, such as small boxes of curiosities and uh, scientific objects, uh, strange artifacts, and then um, optical devices that would play out little scenes. And then I'm jumping to his time in the Surrealist group. Here he is. Um, to the left of Dali is André Breton, which you'll know is the leader of the Surrealist movement. And then to the left and behind him is Paul Eluard, who had a lot to do with orchestrating the installations. And then on the right of Dali is Max Ernst, and to the right of Max Ernst is Man Ray, a couple of other kind of key players in all of this. Um, so Dali developed and contributed a lot to the Surrealist movement, including the paranoid critical method he did to paint little images, um, and also his hand-painted dream photographs, which were seen as really exciting approaches to exploring the unconscious. But it was the Surrealist object, which was the contribution that really allowed all of this to um, come forward. Um, it, it's, it's his proposal of that object really engaged his peers more than any of the other contributions. But before talking about the surrealist object, it almost seems necessary to introduce Marcel Duchamp, um, who was contributing to the surrealist, although he didn't identify as much. He predated the surrealist with the Dada movement. And his objects, the ready-made, here's one of um, you know, the more known, the bicycle wheel. And the idea of the surrealist object really has its roots with Marcel Duchamp. Um, it was Dada movement was born out of the First World War. Uh, which was really out of anger and disgust of the horrors of the time. Um, it was more nihilistic, the movement. It scorned organization, uh, any government, and a result, any traditional notions of what art is. So, um, like I said, what came out of it was the ready-made. Um, so it's two everyday objects paired together to uh, elevate it to a, a, the status of an aesthetic object. And the ready-made here can sort of be seen as detached, as anarchic, uh, there's no rules. From his perspective, Duchamp took the ordinary article of life, placed it so its useful significance disappeared under its new title and point of view, and then created a new thought for that object. Um, but with surrealism came a more promising view of art, and the surrealist ready-made, or the object, was much more subjective, it was much more complicated, 
and more of a reflection of the creator. Take Dolly's lobster phone. So Dolly proposed that by combining familiar objects with other items, a new object would not only be a new aesthetic object, but it would be a symbolically functioning object. So it gives more of a psychological dimension. Um, surreal objects were supposed to elicit some of the repressed desires of the creator and of the viewer. Um, and Dolly published in an article in the Minotaur, which was a surrealist magazine, about uh, different categories of objects. And so he gave this one in particular uh, the object of symbolic function. Um, so two ordinary items paired together, um, they give a new and very provocative take. So the, the resulting creation reveals a certain fetish. So you can imagine how it would function. You put the sexual part of the lobster or the tail to your mouth and the arms sort of menace you about the head. Here's the Venus in the drawers playing on a recurring classical theme. Um, as a child, Dali made a terracotta copy of the Venus de Milo, which gave him, quote, unknown and delicious erotic joy. Um, Marcel Duchamp also coincidentally helped with this one, so they created a mold of the Venus and then they cut the drawers into it. Um, so in a way, by perforating the Venus, he's defacing a classic symbol and he's referring to the drawers as representing areas of our unconscious. So what he says about it is, the open drawers refer to, in his words, a certain complacency in smelling the narcissistic odors emanating from each of our drawers. <laughs> And then back to his sense of uh, play and trickery, he paints it white, so it gives the illusion that it's light, it's plaster, but it's, it's really painted bronze, so um, there's no way you can just pick it up. And a couple of the details here, he's decorated the handles with pom-poms of fur. Oh, and I uh, included this just as um, a way to demonstrate how this idea of animate with inanimate really <coughs> references all the way back to the 17th century with Vercelli's figures. Um, and in 1936, he collaborates with the other Surrealists for the um, exhibition of Surrealist objects. And the Surrealists collectively showed various examples of objects at um, a gallery in Paris that year. They included natural objects, interpreted objects, found objects, mathematical objects, and then the ready-made. Here's another symbolically functioning object, the Marie Oppenheim's fur line teacup. Um, which kind of like the lobster, you can imagine how it works by drinking into a cup of fur. So, pretty scandalous. And the aphrodisiac dinner jacket uh, from the same year. This belonged to the category of a thinking machine um, in Dali's categories of the objects. Uh, the aphrodisiac element of the jacket was the creme de menthe that was filled in each of the small glasses that was attached. Um, he said it could be, quote, suitable for outings on evenings, meteorologically calm, but pregnant with human emotion, provided that the person wearing it were transformed in a very powerful machine, traveling very slowly in order not to upset the liqueurs. <laughs> and moving on to the 36 Surrealist exhibition, which was actually held in London. Um, by this time, surrealist exhibitions were generally small one-man or group shows um, held at various galleries in Paris. And this began to change in the early 30s as surrealism took on artists outside of France. And by that summer, the London Surrealists staged uh, this exhibition. Um, it was made of nearly 70 artists and 400 works. And the show was really traditional in the sense of how it was installed. It was a typical salon style and it drew 20,000 visitors. So you can imagine the, um, you know, the, the uh, enthusiasm people are starting to have for the, the Surrealists by this time. And for the same show, Dali stages sort of um, theatrical scenario or situation uh, where he puts this woman in a rose head outside in the um, Burlington, um, or for the Burlington Magazine outside of, of the square there. And She's sort of like a living example of what he thought was the surrealist woman. And we're really referencing our own painting, the three young surrealist women holding in their arms the skins of an orchestra. Uh, the Rosehead Woman is a recurring theme, and it highlights more of the fashionable connections that Dali was developing um, in the world of couture. 
like his friendships with Scaparelli and Coco Chanel. And of course, Dali then goes on later to design an entire world of fashion advertisements, uh, including textiles, accessories. So in a way, he's taking his painting and he's um, making it in the flesh. It's, it's coming out in, into life. And, and he does this on several instances. The same exhibition I just mentioned, Dali uh, shows up giving a very memorable lecture in a deep sea diver suit. Um, he arrived dressed in the suit and it was symbol it, it symbolized how he was like a diver exploring the subconscious. But the experience almost ended tragically when the helmet's air hose was blocked. Dolly nearly suffocated, so he's flailing about, and the audience, thinking it was part of the show, were applauding, and it was it was great. <laughs> and fortunately, Gala realized his wife Gala realized what was going on, and, and kind of intervened right before something really bad happened. So um, by this time, he's he's really starting to come center stage with with his antics, with these sort of staging scenarios that um, we'll we'll see later. And. On the left is just an image of um, the fantastic art Dada surrealism show that was shown the year after in uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, Dali attended the show, and he was also visiting New York to coincide with his own exhibition at the Julian Levy Gallery. Um, of the Parisian surrealists, only Dali and Man Ray were in attendance. Um, Breton, the leader of the Surrealists were, was having some conflicts with the director, uh, Alfred Barr, about the fact that he was including other movements beyond Surrealism. Um, and I just mention that because it's another reason why the Surrealists were going to end up staging their own uh, show in 38 to really distinguish themselves from Dada. And oh, and the, on the right here is the Bonwit Teller. It was a department store in Manhattan. And that year, he commissioned a group of artists, they, the Bonwit Teller commissioned a group of artists to produce window displays to coincide with the opening of the MoMA show. And Dolly did a piece called, She Was a Surrealist Woman, She Was Like a Figure in a Dream. It attracted the most attention. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't find any images of it. I can imagine that it would include some of the rose-headed women figures, but um, it won't be the, the last time that he does a display for the Bonwit, but it certainly has different reasons why the attention was called to it. Um, the Degenerate Art Show was another show happening that year, uh, which was really troubling uh, for the Surrealists. Um, the Degenerate Art Show was being organized by the Nazis, and it was happening the same year in Munich, and it would travel to 10 cities in Germany and Austria. And really, the exhibit was uh, a a display of what in the Nazis' minds was a collection of work that was deemed degenerate, elitist, morally suspect, incomprehensible. It was really expansive. It, it included 5,000 works of art, and it was intended to incite revulsion against what the Nazis felt was a perversion of a uh, spirit that permeated their culture. Um, it, although it was mainly German artists, it encompassed all movements of modern art. And the way they displayed the work was really chaotic and sort of in a hateful manner. It was um, strung um, by cords. It was hung in these really chaotic temporary partitions. Uh, it was really overfilled and crammed, and um, things were definitely unframed. And some uh, inflammatory rhetoric were on the labels next to the works, kind of explaining why they felt that it was um, morally irreprehensible. So back to Marcel Duchamp. Um, the 1938 show was actually um, organized by Duchamp. Uh, and it was really a reaction to some of these previous shows. They thought it was important to sort of um, uh, separate themselves from that. And the fact that, Del or that Duchamp was going to oversee the show was ideal, because he came from a movement that sort of invented a environment or an ideological space. So the space for him was just as much about displaying the works as capturing um, a collective vision, I guess, of the artists. And the nature of exhibitions from their inception started as solo acts. Um, so they were replaced later on by group exhibitions with like-minded individuals of avant-gardists, and really for safety in numbers. And then the futurists started to present works in a multimedia environment in non-gallery spaces. 
starting in the, in the 1910s. And then after the First World, First World War, the Dadas created spaces that were political, uh, again, going back to the um, anarchic views, and um, they really started to play hijinks on the spectators, the, the patrons that would come. So here is the first international Dada trade fair uh, from 1920. And you'll see that the signs and the works are kind of displayed with equal representation. Um, every inch of the wall space nearly packed with imagery. They even use the overhead of the ceiling to, um, uh, to use as wall space. So the use of the mannequin, which you can see is a, it's a mannequin, but he's covered in the military uh, uniform and he has a pig face. Um, the use of the mannequin and the use of the ceiling as usable space are, are two elements, I guess, that Duchamp would bring into the Surrealist exhibitions. And so the Surrealists, when they were discussing some preliminary um, for the show, they grappled with the issue of how to convey, convey their own ideas uh, without kind of diminishing what it was. Here's the invitation to the Surrealist exhibition. Um, so the Paris exhibition would open at the Gallery Beaux Arts a year after the MoMA show and the Degenerate show. Duchamp was nominated again by Breton and others as the quote, supervisor of scene, the generator of ideas, and the arbitrator of disagreements. Breton and Eluard carried out the discussions with the representatives of Beaux Arts and they arrived at a very ambitious plan. They were going to exhibit 50 artists from 10 countries and they were gonna show 250 works. The exhibition on a whole was scandalous as it was successful, and it was put together in less than four months, which was pretty remarkable. Um, Dolly and Max Ernst were announced as special advisors of the show. Dolly was really invited by Duchamp because at this point, there were lots of quarrels with Andre Breton, the, the leader of the movement, and Dolly was really on his way out. So um, he was, Do Breton was trying to have him really barred from the group. The gallery owner insisted that Dolly had participate in this show. So um, there were a couple of reasons why he, he was included after all. And Dolly was part of some of the preliminary discussions, a really uh, interesting idea that Dolly had that didn't make it through the final cut was um, planting dense fields of grain in front of the works so you'd have to peer through <laughs> the grain to see, to see the paintings. So okay, I'm going in now into the, to the show, what it, what it was really like as as a spectator. So here's the rainy taxi. So visitors arriving to the opening entered a passageway which opened up onto a courtyard uh, ringed by stone buildings. And across the courtyard was a life-sized black taxi, perhaps identical to the one they had just embarked. And most entering wouldn't realize it was the first work of the show and one of the most popular, the rainy taxi. Viewers saw a car bedecked outside with ivy the headlights full on, glaring with brilliant uselessness into the light of day. And Dali said of the rainy taxi that he was inspired by the experience of uh, waiting for a taxi during a downpour in Milan. And the sudden cessation of rain once inside made him think, what if the shower had continued? And here's some of the passengers. In the back seat, a scantily clad female figure uh, with a few live snails uh, were crawling all over her. Beside her was a sewing machine, and on the floor, which you couldn't see, but there was a mass of grass and other vegetation. And inside the cab, the ceiling was fitted with pipes and poured down a continuous torrent of water. The water drained into the courtyard, so probably soaking the guests' evening shoes. And among some of the other details that you can't see, um, but the, the bodice of the, the passenger has a reproduction of the Malay's Angelus, which is a work that Dali ends up reappropriating again and again. And on her lap, she has an omelet. The ivy and the foliage salad were really for the snail's benefits. And there was a, a sign placed on the car and it was addressed to the lady snob. So we're unclear whether it's a jab at the woman riding in the car or if it's a jab at the, the spectator. Um, and the last thing he had planned but didn't carry out was that he was gonna add a dozen tiny frogs, each adorned with a gold crown. But for some reason, it never carried out. And like I said, the rainy taxi was the triumph of the show. There she is, covered with snails, soaking wet. 
here's Mannequin Street on the left. So after viewing the taxi, the patrons would enter through the gallery salon, and then they found themselves at the head of a corridor lined on either side with 16 mannequins, each uniquely dressed by a different artist that was chosen. Um, and it was kind of as far as the eye could see because after that, there was no light. Um, the choice of mannequin was, um, I guess, consonant with the rise of the surrealist object and the use of the ready-made. It was a staple of the subject matter of the surrealist, so it made sense that it belonged here. It was synonymous with surrealism and fashion, and on the other hand, it was um, sort of a long-standing fetish that the surrealists had with um, the female form and the notion of uh, femme fatale. And some of the imagery was violent, some of it was disturbing, uh, like the images of the dismembered mannequins that were re pieced together from Hans Bellmer, um, which would have been on the sides of the mannequins. And then on the right, there's Duchamp's mannequin, who um, really is the only one that plays with the idea of gender. Uh, so he dresses her in a men's suit and shoes with absence of pants, but um, a couple of others are the mannequin on the left from Andre Masson with the birdcage, another uh, recurring motif of the surrealists. And on the right, Dali, it's, it's a great image. He's holding his mannequin um, still in the first stage. He hasn't dressed her yet. And so he's holding um, the, the driver of the taxi next to the first sort of stage of the mannequin that he was designing for the set. Um, and she has a raven's head over her um, turban, that looks like. And then the final state of the mannequin, she's with, with the, ha the raven's hat, and she's wearing sort of a knit helmet, which Scaparelli designed for it. And she's wrapped in a um, piece of paper, and she's decorated in spoons. She has a lot of bird-like aspects. Um, she was sporting really long gloves, her face covered by the, the helmet, which was shocking pink, and covered in the spoons, referencing maybe the aphrodisiac jacket again. And to the right, you'll see another model. Uh, this is a variant that the fashion industry had commissioned for him to design that would be placed in a window display close to where the exhibition was happening. So again, connecting fashion with the surrealists and really with Dali. And then after the corridor of mannequins, you'd go into this grotto, which was not lit. Um, you would pass through the mannequin street and there were four beds in each corners of the room and it was only lit by one um, coal stove in the center of the room. One could barely see that its walls were lined with numerous works, all closely hung together. So maybe we're referencing back the degenerate art show and undermining that. Um, every inch of the space of the room was used. The floor was covered in several inches of sand, as you can see, and, and dead leaves of the forest, which kind of reinforces this strange outdoorsy setting. And here is the 1,200 coal bag suspended from the ceiling over a stove, which was Duchamp's concept piece. It was the largest of the show and um, certainly the most striking feature of it. Uh, it garnered a lot of attention because when you'd walk in the room, the coal, the coal bags would hang really right over your head and it really gave a claustrophobic, disorienting feel. And this, even though the sacks were empty, still there was coal dust that would kind of fall out and, and fall over, over the, you know, over your, your clothing. So here they are. They've been um, equipped with a flashlight because there was no other light. This was thanks to the director of lighting, Man Ray. Um, so they, the, and the other artists were kind of miffed, I guess, with the fact that there was no, there was no real light. So you really couldn't see anything. People were, you know, flashing lights at each other. And, um, and it was the feature that was really most widely mentioned in the papers. You can imagine how shocking. People were not expecting this sort of environment, and then they go in, and they're equipped with a flashlight, and they're looking around, and what are they stepping on? And it was, um, it was remarkable. A couple of notable objects of the show, which we'll go back to, but on the left is um, a piece from Oscar Dominguez called Jamais, or Never, Never Again combining the female body with a mechanical device, uh, which looks like a sort of a gramophone with the legs coming in. And then it turns into a hand that's supposed to read or play the record, which is a breast. And so when you turn the record, 
it actually was equipped with sound and it would make a uh, sound of hysterical laughter when it was touched. So invoking sort of an erotic, tactile, phonetic mixture of, of, of noise. And to the right is a piece done by Andre Breton, which was the exquisite cabinet. And you'll see that the legs of the cabinet have been replaced by women's legs and there are hands above. Um, it kind of goes back to a parlor game that the Surrealists played called the Exquisite Corpse, where you would fold the piece of paper into threes and each person would take turns drawing uh, an image and they would all connect. So by the end, there was this form um, that was nonsensical and it was, it, it played well out in writing and in, in, in drawing like this and then again in, in objects and sculptures. So we go back to this type of Exquisite Corpse figure of a lot. And just talking again about the exquisite cabinet, this is a hosiery ad that Dali did in the mid 40s. So you can see how he's um, responding to those ideas from, from the 30s and from the other surrealists about um, mannequins and, and, and the exquisite corpse type, type figure. And then one last object from the show that I'll mention is again the lobster phone. This is the aphrodisiac telephone. And this was placed by his mannequin. So she was you know, picking up the phone. Um, right next to her hand. I think you can see the, the wrapped dress kind of um, around the, the, the stand here. A um, couple of things about the telephone as it's an object itself. Um, the Enigma of Hitler, I, I put this here just because we go back to the telephone so much in some of the installations and it really references the, the time in which he painted this by 1937. You know, war was uh, very much on, on the minds of Europeans. Um, it references the number of phone calls that um, the Prime Minister of Britain, Chamberlain, made to Hitler in order to avoid war. And in the end, you know, it, it resulted in failure. Um, uh, Hitler ended up annexing Czechoslovakia in order to appease them. So the threat of war under the Nazis was really very real, and in this piece, specifically the telephone sort of looming over this empty plate of beans, perhaps referencing the idea of rationing and the um, small image of, of Hitler. So there's an umbrella to the right and to the left in the scene. It's bleak. And then another person I wanted to introduce just as an aside, uh, Edward James. He commissioned Dolly to do the lobster phones. He did, is there six or eight? I, I, I don't remember. Um, he was, well, the English were really, by and large, not interested in surrealism, but it was Edward James who became Dali's sole patron during, the, during this time in the 30s, and he would give him a monthly stipend, and in return for that, he would get all of his works, and so he's acquired a, a very um, important collection of not only Dali's work, but of other surrealists, like René Magritte. And here's a portrait of Edward James by Magritte, And here is Edward James's home, the Moncton House. And I don't have a lot of details about it, except it was, it was not Dali's surreal project, it was James's, but Dali contributed a few um, decorating details of, of, the, of the house. The lip sofa, and he commissioned, like I said, the lobster phones, and then here is Dali's armchair. And James was a really interesting character. Um, he would eventually, I believe it was in the 50s, move to central Mexico and create another expansive surreal environment in the middle of the jungle, which is where he lived until he died. So if you're interested in pursuing that, a Google search on Edward James will bring up so many really neat images. Uh, so by 1939, Dolly's relationship with Breton is pretty much over. Uh, Europe was becoming pretty shaky with the intrusion of World War II. Dali was already a star in America by this point, so this is where he would go to live in exile for the next 10 years. And as far as the Surrealists, the impact of the installation that I just mentioned prompted several efforts to repeat or to expand on that type of installation. Um, they did an abbreviated version the year later in Amsterdam and in Brussels. And then in 1942, Marcel Duchamp again orchestrates a new show with um, Breton called First Papers of Surrealism, and this is his concept piece, 16 Miles of String. Um, 
They collaborated with nine other artists from the 38th show, and it was held at the uh, Whitlaw Reed Mansion on Madison Avenue in New York, uh, which was a, a historic landmark. And the show was brokered by Scaparelli, again, another fashion connection, and it was proposed as a benefit show for um, a French relief society. And so Duchamp created this concept, 16 miles of string that juxtaposed a traditional salon arrangement with a web of string that was wrapped around from the ceiling to the floor and all around. Um, so you would basically have to climb through the string to get to see the works. And like Duchamp does, he puts the viewer in a kind of a frustrating or a really unique uh, position of being able to get directly in front of the work, although you can see it, so you kind of have to climb around. And the idea is that, I guess, Duchamp creates an exhibition space that negates the actual purpose of, of exhibiting, so it's interesting. And going back to the fact that Dali being very big in America by 36, he's on the cover of Time magazine. This photo, again, by Man Ray. And here are a couple of images of a dream ball that he was um, part of. Uh, it was it was given by some New York socialites, Carice Crosby and Joelle Levy at the Cope Rouge in New York. It was a huge success. Much of New York's high society was in attendance. So you see some of the unusual costumes. Um, here's the inv invitation on the left. And on the right, a companion uh, painting of the same, the same topic. Kind of going back to the exquisite corpse idea again, matching the snail shoe slippers with a female form and a head as a baby bassinet. And then this is a cartoon from the New Yorker called A Surrealist Family Has the Neighbors in for Tea, which was around the same time. It's just, I show it to highlight really the growing enthusiasm and awareness that Americans had for a Dali environment, really a surrealist environment, but most of it is very Dali from the Deep sea diver having tea to the eye thump, or to the eye lamp, and we'll see the um, the curtain holding the egg, the mannequin, sh the, the mannequin leg shades, and then going back to Von Witt Teller, this is the second installation that he did. Um, 1939 is a really big year for Dolly in America. He had a solo exhibition at the New York Levy, uh, the New York Julian Levy Gallery. Um, and Levy helped line up a commission from the Bonwit Teller to do another window display. This time the theme was day and night for the north and south windows on Fifth Avenue. Um, unfortunately, there are no images, but there is really great description of what the uh, installation looked like, so I will read to you. The display was made up of a series of outmoded mannequins made of wax with long natural dead women's hair, which he served the Fifth Avenue public, quote, as one serves an old bottle of cognac that has just been brought up from the cellar. They are covered in cobwebs and dust. For day, one is dressed in green feathers and a flowing red wig. She stands beholding a claw-footed bathtub lined in curly black Persian lamb and filled with water. Out of the water rise three disembodied hands clasping mirrors. Narcissi float on top of the pool. For night, Another antique mannequin appears to be sleeping on a bed of live coals under the watchful eyes of a taxidermic buffalo head with a bloody pigeon in its jaws. Dali described the buffalo head as the decapitated head and the savage hooves of a huge bison weakened by millions of years of sleep. So he finishes this installation at six the next morning. He uh, goes to his hotel and three hours later when the store opens, crowds are there uh, complaints start coming in, and the managers <laughs> found that the mannequin with the green feathers was too erotic, so they took it upon themselves to replace the mannequin with a more modern one, um, probably with Bonwit Teller attire, and Dali came in, saw what had happened, was completely furious, he made a huge scene, he started entering into the window um, to change the display back to what it was, and he was moving this bathtub filled with water, and the tub slipped and crashed through the store window onto the street, Dali nearly becoming decapitated by a large shard of glass. Here's a cartoon from the incident with the fur lined tub. Um, coincidentally, a cast of characters from the art world were there at the moment, so 
uh, Jackson Pollock was there, Jimmy Ernst, the son of Max Ernst, were there. And I guess this idea of um, unveiling the window displays was a big event in New York, and so a lot of people from the art world were there, again, making the fashion connection. So Dolly immediately arrested. He spots his friend Levy in the crowd, tells him to get a lawyer. And here's a picture of Dolly at the station with his lawyer. Um, the police took him to the station. The judge quickly released him, stating that the artist should have complete control over his creation. All the charges were dropped. And Dolly walked. <laughs> uh, this in, in, so this happened at the same time he was having his solo exhibition at Julian Levy, and it was a complete success. I think the, um, the, the, the success that it garnered from you know, the incident uh, led him to have a lot of enthusiasm for the, the show. He sold nearly all of his works. Um, you could see the Life magazine talking about people standing in line to see his double image paintings. Um, moving sort of on to the next huge installation that he did that same year, uh, Julian Levy, um, was the one who introduced Dolly to American audiences with his exhibitions, and it was also Levy who had the idea of erecting a surrealist fun house in the amusement area of the New York World's Fair. He had initially proposed a fun house that was sort of in line with what they had done in Paris in 38 with the other surrealists, but it was really only Dolly that was popular enough to secure financing, so it became his own project, his sole project. And Here's the pamphlet for the New York World's Fair, and then uh, and the image to the right is um, kind of an overview of, of how expansive it really was. There were 44 million people that attended in the two years that it was in existence, and it was the second largest fair in America. Um, and the slogan was, the world of tomorrow. So on the official pamphlet, there was a note that read, the eyes of the fair are on the future in the sense of presenting a new and clearer view of today in preparation for tomorrow a view of the forces and ideals that prevail, prevail as well as the machines. Um, the show was represented by these two um, modern aerodynamic uh, sculptures, the Trilon and the Perisphere. And then here is Dali's uh, version of the Trilon and the Perisphere. <laughs> and here's Dali's pavilion, the Dream of Venus. This is the exterior. So where the fair was exhibiting architecture of tomorrow, Dali was interested in exhibiting the architecture of the dream. Um, and in the context of the modern style, it was Dali going the opposite direction and creating, and celebrating, and everything that was sort of antiquated. He was bringing back Art Nouveau. And this is taken right from Gaudí's architecture from Barcelona from the previous century, um, Antony Gaudí, um, you know, visionary architect. And so the Dream of Venus was sort of a hilarious entertainment, but at the same time a surrealist experiment. It was seen as another opportunity for Dali to be able to take all of this to the masses. So on the outside is a giant image of Botticelli's nude Venus. At her feet are real women. They were um, wearing bathing suits, waving bamboo fishing rods, or reeling you into the grotto. Um, here's a publicity shot of Dali and Gala. So you'd enter through this entrance, you would you know, pay uh, by putting the coins through the fish's eye, and then you'd walk in. And there is a bit of nudity here, so just a warning. Um, so he, there was really one description that gave the layout uh, as well as it did from, from a book um, by Ingrid Schaffner, and she wrote, you cannot go into the first chamber that you come to because it is filled with water. Peering through a glass wall, you discern in the depths a weird parlor. A fire roars in the fireplace, despite the aqueous atmosphere, which causes all the telephones to lift off their receivers and float on their cords like seaweed. The ubiquitous piano is open for playing. Its keyboard is a supine woman. This is a rubber woman. Suddenly, swimmers flash into view. One perches on the piano stool and plays the keys. Another grabs at the phones. Others bring the rest of the room to life by typing on a typewriter or milking a mummified cow who gazes sweetly through her gauze. The swimmers are in daring attire with fishnet hose and corslets. Some have spiny headgear. And next you notice two men in the tank. The body of one is composed entirely of large square chains. 
Both are anchored to the floor, and like everything else in the room, they jiggle frantically when the ladies dive by. In the distance, you see Vesuvius erupting, and it's the, the back wall of the parlor, which opens to a, kind of a Pompeii landscape. And then, the next chamber is long, it's dry, it's occupied by a 36-foot-long bed. Under a red satin sheet lies a beautiful Venus of a girl. While you watch her sleep, you can hear her dreaming, quote, in the fever of love, I lie upon my ardent bed, a bed eternally long, and I dream my burning dreams, the longest dreams ever dreamed without beginning and without end. Enter the shell of my house, and you will see my dreams. Um, her peaceful slumber is protected by another girl who merges out of the headboard and puts a finger to her lips to shush you. You notice a figure reflected in the mirror beside her bed. Um, her neck is neurotically twitching and jerking, perhaps in an attempt to shake off the massive rose head that is at the end of it. The woman's head is caged in a ball of flowers. And then the bed and sort of the dry stage. Walking towards the foot of the bed, you notice that the coverlet is dotted with small beds of hot coals surrounded by lobsters and bottles of champagne. Above this aphrodisiac spread and continuing into the corridor, hundreds of black umbrellas are hanging like bats. Most of them, they're open. Some have hanks of human hair or a telephone receiver dangling from their tips. And the corridor is a gallery, so there's two tableaus filled with strange people and furniture. In the first tableau stands a male mannequin sporting a leopard's head, his body dotted with shot glasses, and the lips on the nearby table are, are mute on the question, why is this man in a birdcage? So you'll notice the fantastic backdrop that unifies the tableau. It's a desert landscape. The soft watches, Dali's self-portrait, referencing the persistence of memory, his iconic work. And among the objects are the flaming uh, uh, giraffes. And there's the, the, the Freud figure with drawers, the lobster phone, the rose-headed woman. And then you, re you reach the final chamber, which is uh, a taxi, a rainy taxi. The cab driver is yet another sexy lady. This one, she's wearing skin-tight attire. Her passenger is a dour figure whom, for some reason, you recognize to be Christopher Columbus. The cab festooned on the outside with branches of ivy and more ladies, and inside the cabin, the cabin is raining. So, kind of ends her description, but the taxi, to give a few more details, he takes the Paris taxi, and this time he uses a Cadillac, and he puts Columbus in the back seat, two elements synonymous with American culture. He's wearing a Spanish Baratina, typical hat from where Dolly is from, and he identifies with Columbus as um, they both are sort of explorers, exploring a new world. And here are a couple of publicity shots with some of the crustacean mermaids. Um, and what he did is he took the nude photographs and then he took um, ink and painted the what seemed like a swimming suit over it, including the masks. And the amusement zone of the fair, I should say, is a place where there was lots of accepted nudity. This was not the only pavilion, um, which seems remarkable being that it was 1939. Uh, so next to the Dream of Venus, there were, for instance, the Ice Girls. They were swimsuited women suspended in huge blocks of ice for several minutes until they were released. There was the Sun Valley, a winter wonderland type of amusement with ice skaters. There was the Crystal Palace um, with the Museum of Changing American Taste. And then there were the living magazine covers, um, which would uh, enact living covers, but topless. So here's Dolly and, and Gala sort of their warehouse where they were constructing all the elements for, for the show. And the financing came from a rubber manufacturer who thought he would get some, some play by using rubber for the elements of the show. And he had some conflicts with Dolly in creating this. So this, the, the project, although it took five weeks to complete, um, the ideas really very soon came into conflict with the sponsor's interests. Um, he thought that the costs were through the roof and some of the, uh, the elements were pretty objectionable, which um, was really the, the facade. It was a Botticelli's Venus, but Dolly wanted to put a fish's head on it instead of her face. And he found that very objectionable, and so he did everything possible to prevent it from happening. He went to the World's Fair Committee and told them what was going on. They ended up siding with the, the manufacturer, and 
which prompted Dali to write a manifesto. So Dali had missed the opening of the fair. He was on his way to Paris to uh, work on a ballet set. And before leaving, he had hired a plane to drop printed leaflets over New York. And this is the, this is the leaflet with the Botticelli with the fish's head. And um, it's titled The Declaration of the Independence of the Imagination and the Rights of Man to His Own Madness. Uh, there's a great quote from it. it says, only the violence and duration of your hardened dream could be able to resist the hideous mechanical civilization. So one more um, installation before I get to the theater museum. It's the Surrealist Forest, which is <clears throat> um, a project that he and Gala did um, as they moved into America during the early 40s. They, they, they held a ball for refugee um, artists from during World War II. And it was supposed to be uh, an event to raise money to benefit the artists and writers. And so um, he is dressed as a skeleton, I guess with the, the, the heads on the side, and Gala is dressed with a horse's cape. And she's on a on a bed, kind of like the Venus Pavilion, so the table is this 36 foot long table and all of the uh, people that are sitting there are dining and it's lined with mannequins along the sides and using Duchamp's idea for the coal sacks, he hangs sugar sacks along the, the spot here. And I, I'm really reluctant to show the YouTube just for the sake of time. I, if you're interested later, I can um, email you the link. It's, it's great. It's just a, a 40 second clip of of how people were uh, dressed, and it was for Hollywood, so you'd see people like Bob Hope there, and you know, um, it was a it was a great success. So I was going to talk about Dolly's private life and how he staged these environments at home, but for the sake of time, I just decided to go right into his last project, which started in 1960 at the Theater Museum. Um, that here's Dolly at the theater museum during the construction. And it was fitting that he had it in Figueres because that is where he was born and that at the, uh, that's where he died in 1989. Um, the creation of the museum evolved in a very typical Dillinian way. The mayor of Figueres asked the artist in 1960 to donate some of his, uh, just a few paintings to the town so the local museum could display a special Dolly room. And Dolly, in a very expansive mood, promised instead to donate enough paintings to fill a whole museum and proposed transforming the ruins of the municipal theater, uh, which was destroyed during the Spanish Civil War, into a Dolly museum. It would take 14 years to complete, um, but it could be seen as one of Dolly's largest creative ventures that he did. So here's the Teatro Museo's geodesic dome and the Torre Galatea. Um, so the mayor and city council agreed to the original proposal of, of building the museum, and they soon hit some snags. Dali insisted that the city stage a promotional bullfight fiesta with a sensational ending that the helicopter would lift a dead bull as a sacrificial tribute to the, quote, verticality of Spain. City officials agreed, although reluctantly, and uh, were pretty relieved, I guess, for uh, bad weather when... <laughs> the museum open kind of scotched the, the show. So. Um, so his conception for the museum is radically different from any traditional notion of an art museum. So he's showing not just specific items in a collection, but going back to creating a surreal experience. So you're going through sort of a funhouse environment while at the same time you're seeing some really distinguished works of art. Um, he said he wanted his museum to be like a great surrealist object that would make people leave with the sensation of having had a theatrical dream. Um, so it has the air of a manic fun house. Here's the tower that he um, bought as an adjacent building to the theater, and he painted it sort of a pink. He festooned with eggs and bread a couple of symbols from Dali's career. And here's the outside of the museum. Um, there's the Newton sculpture with the molecule atom and breadheads along the railing. 
and exquisite corpses are everywhere, so you see these mannequins and bodies everywhere. There's more bodies overlooking the courtyard. There's a body coming out of the rocks, so this idea of the morphological transformation of, of the rocks. And here's the geodesic dome, the dramatic icon of the museum that kind of you could see throughout the town, um, sort of a symbol of the town. And there's a tire column and a boat, and above it there is an umbrella, which is open here. And here's the patio courtyard. He recreates a third version of the Cadillac. And this time when you put a euro in the slot, it shakes and it rains. And here's the courtyard at night, just so you can see uh, through the window um, of in, inside under the cupola. And here's the cupola. And then under the dome, you'll see the first version of the Lincoln painting, Gala contemplating the Mediterranean. We have the second version upstairs if you've not yet seen it. Another great optical illusion. In the treasure room, these were Dolly's favorites. Um, on the very left, on the far corner, you see a very simple painting of a basket of bread. It, it was an anniversary piece for Gala. He painted it because she didn't want anything more than um, that simple basket of bread that he had painted uh, several years before, which is the one in our collection from 1926 when he was leaving um, art school in Madrid. And then a couple of other ideas here is an, another installation that really recalls Dream of Venus and the 38th Exposition with the use of the ivy and um, he titled it Paradise. And then the May West room with furniture. So, and then on the ceiling there's a bathtub and sort of an arrangement above. And so when you walk in, if you don't know about it, you might not know what you're looking at and it's only until you stand in front of this viewer that the room becomes the face of Mae West. So continuing the theme of illusion, of fashion, of eroticism, of metamorphosis. So here's a better image on the left of what Mae West looks like through the viewer. And then here is his original portrait from 34. And talking about more metamorphosis or more ideas of transformation, you go through um, we have a face figure through into another uh, gallery. The Palace of the Winds Room with the ceiling uh, as a mural of a trompe l'oeil. There's Dali painting it. And here's the image from, seen from below. It's Gala and Dali and they're raining gold coins on the Spanish countryside. And some of the funhouse elements of the, the museum. There's some funhouse furniture with the serpent legs and the sofa that sort of is an illusion that he paints the, the furniture here. And there's all these small details that if you don't pay attention, you might miss. The spoon snake woman, so an Art Nouveau head, and it's just her head, and then it becomes a snake of collage spoons that spiral down from the second floor to the first floor. And then Deli's favorite shoe, the espadrille, used as a decorative piece. The bust of Velasquez, which turns into three figures conversing. Uh, we have the companion piece here, which is New Amsterdam. So we painted this, the um, slave merchants on the face of an existing uh, bust by Charles Schreibogel. And Velasquez was his favorite Spanish artist, and he attributes his mustache to Velasquez as well. And then finally, this uh, image, I, I, I include this because it's almost like Dali has his last um, act of theatrical staging and that he's buried underneath the cupola here. Um, he's buried under the main chamber of the museum and the hallway is guarded by this looming figure with uh, his torso that's it's cut through. Um, and this was the backdrop for a ballet that he had painted uh, called Labyrinth in 1941. So. That concludes my talk on environments, so thank you.